So hemochromatosis is an autosomal dump, autosomal recessive, excuse me, disorder characterized by iron overload. It's caused by a defect in the HFE, which is a term for high iron gene on chromosome six. And for me, I remember that it's on chromosome six because I think of the high FE has six letters. Uh, two mutations that are worth knowing, they do test this occasionally, this C282Y and H63D mutation. I, I don't have a useful mnemonic for those. Those are just uh, two mutations that you do have to keep in mind though for hemochromatosis. Also occasionally it's associated with this HLA a3 subtype. So what I want to do is I want to discuss hemochromatosis pathogenesis. Uh, we've talked about this in the small intestine lecture because I, I wanted to let you know that I, I showed you how normal iron, iron absorption works. So we'll go over that again here though. So normally what's going to happen is that iron is absorbed by our duodenal enterocytes. And here's our Duodenum, this again is from our small intestine anatomy section. And I just mentioned here that the duodenum, duodenum is very important for iron absorption. And our total iron levels are tightly regulated by a protein called hepcidin, or it can also be referred to as hepcidin. And if you ever have defective hepcidin production, you're gonna get increased intestinal iron absorption into the bloodstream. And all this excess iron, the problem with the excess iron is that it can undergo something called the Fenton reaction, which will cause free radical damage to many, many organs. And so this, I'm gonna start it off by talking about the exact same mechanism we discussed in the small intestine regarding uh, normal iron absorption. So on the top, we have our GI lumen. I drew a couple of duodenal enterocytes. I also have the bloodstream at the bottom and the liver. And there's two different types of iron. You can have heme iron and non-heme iron. So heme iron is the type of iron that you usually get if you consume like meat products and that meat already has red blood cells that have iron in them and heme. So what's gonna happen is that that consumed red blood cell will have heme and it'll have globin. And that heme can actually be transported into the enterocyte through a heme transporter. And from there, now that heme can be broken down, the iron from that heme can be uh, broken down. And so you'll have Fe2 plus. From there, and I just wanna clarify the difference between Fe2 plus and three plus, so Fe2 plus is called ferrous iron. And what we'll find, especially when we have to absorb non-heme iron is that ferrous iron is often the form of iron. So that two plus is the form that can actually be uh, moved across the membrane. So for, from the GI lumen to the enterocyte or even from the enterocyte into the bloodstream, it has to be in that Fe2 plus or ferrous form. On the other hand, this Fe3 plus form here is called ferric iron, and this is more of our storage iron. And all of our storage iron is, as, is also stored as ferritin, which is also in the three plus form. And how I remember the difference between Fe2 plus, I just remember like a Ferris wheel has uh, the ideal amount of people on a Ferris wheel at one time, or two people, because you're, you know, you're going on a nice date on the Ferris wheel. And then if your friend Eric comes along, then you'll have this ferric form with three people on the Ferris wheel, which is not ideal. So kind of moving back. So this ferrous iron has two choices. Once it is degraded, the heme, uh, once the ferrous iron is taken out of the heme, it has two choices. It can either be stored in the enterocyte itself in this ferric form, this three plus form, or it can use something called the ferroportin enzyme to actually get transported from the duodenal enterocyte and into the bloodstream directly. Let's talk about how non-heme iron works. There's a little bit of a difference in the, especially within the GI lumen. So non-heme iron normally starts at that, as that uh, ferric form. And remember what I just said is that that ferric form 
it's not the ideal number of, it's not the ideal number. The ferrous form is what we want in order to transport it into our enterocyte. So what has to happen first is that you have to have a cytochrome B uh, help convert that iron from the ferric form to the ferrous form. And it does this with using vitamin C as a cofactor. And that's why sometimes when you are prescribed iron tablets, sometimes they'll prescribe it with vitamin C to enhance absorption through this mechanism. So now that we have it in that ferrous form, we need to get it into the cell and we have to use these DMT1 transporter to get it into the cell. Now keep in mind, this transporter is a divalent metal transporter. So it's not specific to just the two plus form of iron. It's any divalent metal. So all of these divalent metals can also use this same transporter. And that's why if you ever took an iron tablet and drank a lot of milk with it, you might actually have decreased absorption because this DMT1 transporter might be using all of its resources to absorb the calcium instead of your iron that you really want in the enterocyte. And again, once it once this iron makes it into the enterocyte and it's in this ferrous form, it can do the same two steps that we saw for this heme iron. It can either be stored in the enterocyte in the ferric form, or it can use that same ferroportin enzyme to be released into the bloodstream. And now once it's released into the bloodstream, the iron does the same thing. It can either be, it's usually converted quickly back to this ferric form. And uh, from this ferric form, it can actually bind to a molecule called transferrin. And most of our iron that's floating in our bloodstream is attached to, is bound to this molecule called transferrin. It's a good way to move the iron around in the bloodstream. Now, ultimately, we don't want all the iron just floating around in the bloodstream as transferrin. We want a place to store it as ferritin. And so what's going to happen is that this ferric form of iron or ferritin has three places that it predominantly likes to store. It can store in the splenic macrophages. It can store in the bones. And a common place for uh, iron storage is in our liver. So now let's discuss how this whole process can be regulated to help control the amount of iron that's in our bloodstream at a given time. So let's say we have a situation where we have a ton of iron in our bloodstream. What can our body do to counteract this? Well, our liver can produce an enzyme called, a, a hormone called hepcidin. And what hepcidin can do is it can interact with these ferroportin uh, enzymes, these transporters, and it can inhibit ferroportin. And so what will happen if you inhibit ferroportin is that you will not, no longer have all of this ferrous iron able to escape the duodenal enterocyte into the bloodstream. So if no iron is entering the bloodstream anymore, you're going to have decreased levels of iron in your blood. And so that's a good way to regulate it when your iron levels are too high. So what happens in hemochromatosis, though, is that this hepcidin gene right here, this hepcidin hormone, is defective. So we don't we don't produce that hepcidin that we really need. And if you don't have any hepcidin, then these ferroportin uh, molecules are able to roam freely. There's nothing to inhibit them from transporting all of the iron in the duodenal enterocyte into the bloodstream. And so you're going to get iron overload. And so the symptoms of hemochromatosis are all related to iron overload. It's just in different parts of the body, they would cause different things. So let me put a couple of the organs out there and let's talk about what happens when you have too much iron in each of these organs. So in the liver, if you have too much iron, you're gonna have uh, liver cirrhosis over time. I mentioned briefly that all that iron that gets into your bloodstream can undergo a Fenton reaction and cause free radical damage. And so if you have too much free radical damage in your liver, it'll ultimately cause inflammation and cirrhosis. And as we've discussed many times now, anytime you have liver cirrhosis, that can increase your risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. And in the case of hemochromatosis, HCC is the most common cause of death. 
in the pancreas, all of that iron deposition can actually destroy your islets of Langerhans. And we know we needed our islets of Langerhans to produce things like beta cells. And if you have a lack of beta cells, if they're getting destroyed by all this iron definition, uh, deposition, you can end up with new onset diabetes. All the iron that's deposited in the skin causes this classic bronze pigmentation. In your heart, the deposition can cause either a restrictive cardiomyopathy or a dilated cardiomyopathy. If you have iron in your joints, you can get something called pseudo gout, which is calcium pyrophosphate deposition. This seems kind of low yield, but I've seen this on a number of tests where they give you somebody who has calcium pyrophosphate disease and they give you some other nonspecific, some other symptoms that appear nonspecific at first, but then you realize that it is actually part of this entire hemochromatosis clinical picture. So I would remember that calcium pyrophosphate, that pseudo gout. And finally, if you have iron depositing in your pituitary gland, you're gonna get a loss of hormones from your pituitary gland and that can lead to hypogonadism. And I just wanted to highlight this because the classic presentation that you hear about in hemochromatosis is this bronze diabetes. And that's because of this iron deposition in your pancreas and in your skin. But don't forget some of these other ones, especially, I mean, the cirrhosis is super important. Uh, I've also seen this restrictive cardiomyopathy and the pseudo gout tested quite a bit. So how do we uh, evaluate whether somebody has hemochromatosis or not? So on laboratory studies, if we take somebody and give them an iron panel, they want you to know what, what laboratory markers are gonna be shown. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that your iron levels will be increased in a condition like hemochromatosis because there's no counter-regulatory mechanism to, to turn off the iron, essentially. Your ferritin, which is the storage form of iron, will also be increased. Your total iron binding capacity will be decreased. This TIBC is always inverse to ferritin. I think Pathoma mentioned that one time, and it's a very helpful tip. I'm going to go over this in a pictorial representation in a moment, so keep that in mind. And our percent saturation will also be increased. So what I want to do is I want to talk about each of those four lab values, just so everybody's on the same page as to why these lab values hold true. So our total iron is the amount of iron that's in your body. I mentioned that once your iron gets in your bloodstream, the majority of it gets quickly attached to transfer transferrin to move through the bloodstream. And so in a condition like hemochromatosis, where our ferroportin receptors, I mean, our ferroportin uh, enzymes here can pretty much roam freely without any counter-regulation, you're gonna get a ton of iron in our bloodstream. Most of that iron will attach to transferrin and we can measure all that iron. And in this case, we're gonna have excessive iron. And so our total iron will be increased. Our ferritin is the amount of iron that's stored. And so again, if you have all this transfer in here, all this iron in your bloodstream, a lot of it's gonna go into the splenic macrophages, the bones or the liver. And so you'll get a ton of storage iron, also known as ferritin, and that can be measured and, and that'll be increased on laboratory studies. Your total iron binding capacity that measures your ability of proteins like transferrin to bind free iron. So it's their capacity to bind free iron. Notice though, that in a condition that has a ton of iron in your blood, that'll basically saturate all of your transferrin molecules. So your ability to bind additional free iron molecules is gonna be decreased because most of the iron, most of the sites that this, this transferrin has are already bound by a ferric form of iron. So your TIBC in this case will be decreased because these free iron, these free ferric molecules don't have an ability to bind to these transferrin, these saturated transferrin molecules. Lastly, let's talk about transferrin saturation. This is pretty much the same thing. There's an equation here that you can use if you'd like where it takes the total serum iron divided by the total iron capacity 
the total iron binding capacity and you multiply that by 100%. And this will estimate the percentage of transfer and binding sites that are saturated with iron. So in this example, where you have eight total binding sites and only four of them are bound to, only four of the eight sites actually have something bound to them, that could give you a theoretical saturation of 50%. In this case here though, and this is more consistent with hemochromatosis, you have a significant transfer and saturation. All your sites are bound. So you get you know, a, an increased saturation. I wanna point out though, even in hemochromatosis, you don't usually get 100% saturation. It's not close to that, but just the example holds true that the percent saturation will be significantly increased in a condition like hemochromatosis. On biopsy, this will show hemosiderin on a Prussian blue stain. So hemosiderin is a conglomerate. It has ferritin, lipids, lysosomes, and other proteins. It's basically a trash dump. And in this case, it'll contain lots of ferritin. Your body essentially doesn't have anywhere else to put this ferritin. So it'll kind of try to store it in this, in this form. And the thing is we have other, uh, we have other compounds in our body or other organelles in our body, I should say, that also act as these trash dumps. For example, as you age, you're gonna have this thing called lipofusion that's gonna accumulate in your cells as well. And this is not ferritin. This is just your normal debris that it can't be excreted. And so why I mention this is that if you ever wanna distinguish, I wonder if this is hemosiderin, is this some sort of ferritin that's being stored in my cell? Or is this just our, our normal cellular debris that we couldn't excrete, this lipofusion? If you wanna find out if it's hemosiderin versus lipofusion, you can use this Prussian blue stain. And in this example here, you can see they stained this in Prussian blue and it will light up all the ferritin in blue. So that's that's in hemochromatosis, you're gonna see this. If you ever stain it with Prussian blue, you're gonna see these blue dots everywhere within the cells. And that's the hemosiderin that contains ferritin scattered throughout the cells. In contrast, this is an example of that lipofusion. And if you stained this on Prussian blue, you would not see any blue granules in here. So how do we treat hemochromatosis? One way we can do it, because there's so much iron within our bloodstream, we can actually use a phlebotomy. We can take out some of that blood and to basically ameliorate some of that excess iron. You can also chelate iron, and there's several medications that are used to chelate iron, basically to bind to that iron so it doesn't deposit in any of those tissues and cause the problems that we discussed earlier. You can use deferoxamine, deferazerox, and uh, deferoprone. These are just common chelators. So anything, if you're on a test, just think about this, this defer as iron chelators. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content.